go ahead and applaud yourselves too. You go for it. If I were you, I'd be patting myself on the back for attending a conference all about collective genius. Yep, I'd be feeling pretty smart right about now, maybe even a little geniusy. I get all that out of your system right now, though, because I'm about to get you in touch with your inner idiot. <laughs> You've probably guessed that collective genius is a darn good idea since all these other whip-smart speakers are talking about it, and it is, but it's even better if you inject a little craziness into it. You're about to meet the madman who did precisely that 60 years before the Harvard Business Review coined the phrase collective genius. In fact, decades before those Harvard folks even expensed their first business lunch, the gang at Mad Magazine invented creative madness, pioneering a creative philosophy that we can all use to release our hidden creative potential. By the end of the rant by the old Beardo on the red carpet, you will see that the maddest leaders foster extreme diversity of thought, and that means embracing oddballs, nuts, and weirdos of all kinds. If we really want to unleash collective genius, we're all going to have to commit ourselves and go a little mad. Before we get started, though, let's remind each other of what collective genius actually is. In 2014, the Harvard Business Review published groundbreaking work that junked conventional thinking about leadership and replaced it with a brand spanking new philosophy. Or at least to convince executives to throw out their old unread management books and buy some new management books to not read instead. If I were going to condense their hundreds of pages into some bullet points for you to cheat on your Management 101 midterm next, well, next month, I would go for one, build a community of diverse talents with shared values and a sense of purpose. Two, allow conflicts and debate within this community. Three, channel these conflicts into new ideas. Four, practice ag agility through the rapid deployment of these ideas. And five, stand back and watch the innovation explode. That's real good thinking there, Harvard. Pretty, pretty good. But I think you might have forgotten something. And I think I know some folks who can help us find our way. Yeah, I know, these are the kind of words your mom told you not to say in public. I'm gonna say them a lot, though, in the next few minutes to get you used to hearing them, saying them, and being them. All of these terms need to be reclaimed and celebrated. Just do me a favor and don't tell your mom where you picked them up. Weird is one of my all-time favorite words. It originally came from the old English word for destiny, or weird. So for me, weird means that special kind of inspired nut who sees the world a little differently and can peek into the future. I think you know the type. <laughs> Today we're talking about one of the weirdest of them all, a man who bounced from the Bible to horror to humor. William M. Gaines was a comics publisher who practiced mad leadership, turning American business practice over onto its head and teaching generations of wise asses how to go mad. But before we see how he created collective madness, let's see what drove him mad in the first place. It was the 1950s. Americans, after years of belt tightening during World War II, had to be lured back into the pleasures of buying lots and lots of new crap to kickstart the economy. <laughs> Enter advertisers and their new electronic Trojan horse, television, every household's newest family member. Soon, everyone loved Lucy. Father always knew best, and we all left it to the beaver. We watched what everyone else watched, bought what everyone else bought. Everyone dreamed of being part of a nuclear family with a television in every atomic fallout shelter. Wives were marched from the wartime assembly line back into the home. Husbands became obedient organization men, conformist armies of men in gray flannel suits. Unsurprisingly, men and women were soon stocking up on his and her martini glasses and prescription tranquilizers. <laughs> but if you listened closely, you could hear the rumblings of resistance snapping fingers at beatnik poetry recitals, growling creatures at drive-in monster movies, 
screams of Elvis Presley fans. You could even still hear the faint echoes of that resistance today if you took those damn earbuds out every once in a while. <laughs> the all-night radio host, Gene Shepard, also heard the resistance and the voices of the kooks who called him to talk about mind control and UFOs and bebop. And in 1957, he described the sound for the squares in what became the most important intellectual manifesto of the century. Shepard divided the country into two. The night people, the weirdos who listened to the strange sounds of the world after the normals dropped off to sleep, and the mind-numbed, mediocre mainstream whom he called the creeping meatballs. People today, people today have a genuine fear of stepping out and thinking on their own, he warned. Creeping meatballism is this rejection of individuality. The idea of thinking individually has become a big joke. Only one magazine had the mad genius to publish this bold attack on American blandness, and it wasn't the Harvard Business Review. <laughs> yep, you guessed it. Gene Shepard was only one of Mad's many mad contributors. As we'll see, Bill Gaines was good at a lot of things, but his greatest genius was collecting other geniuses. He led Mad, but mostly it's madness, and it's madmen led him. When Bill inherited his dad's company, Educational Comics, in the 1940s, he found himself cranking out respectable Bible and history comics that parents and teachers loved. But Bill's personal taste lurked elsewhere. By 1950, he had turned Puff's EC into entertaining comics. Bill collected the wildest creatives he could find and let them loose on some of the most fantastic, gruesome, disturbing, and thrilling comics of all time. And a barely profitable 10-cent comedy comic, too. That's number one right there. But soon the creeping meatballs struck back. And one party pooper in particular, a shrink named Dr. Frederick Wortham, told Americans that comics were responsible for destroying our nation's youth in his infamous scare screed, The Seduction of the Innocent. <laughs> he deserves it. Now, as hard as this might be to believe, the U.S. Senate took Dr. Wortham seriously. And yeah, I know that's as nuts as if Congress people today blame video games for teenage violence, you know, something insane, right? Bill Gaines, I'm sorry, Congress schlepped Gaines in front of the subcommittee on juvenile delinquency. He brought his snarkiness along with him, explaining to the legislators why he thought this cover was within the bounds of good taste. Bill told the senators, a cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding her head a little higher so that blood could be seen dripping from it. Congress was not amused, and neither was the rest of the comics industry who got the government off their backs by creating the Comics Code Authority, a self-censoring seal of approval that promised that comics would never again see adult themes or wild flights of creativity. This imposed conformity made, made Gaines lose all interest in comics. Fortunately for the history of American culture, though, he didn't give up, but brainstormed a new direction. What if instead of publishing comics, he made fun of them in a magazine that could run around the comics code? What if he unleashed the, cra unleashed the crazies that made his sci-fi and horror books so subversive and let them loose to parody the meatball world around them. Gaines' collective of geniuses became Mad Magazine's bullpen brain trust, and the world was never the same. Other 1950s business leaders policed their employees with community-destroying, soul-crushing time management techniques. But Gaines zigged where they zagged. As long as the magazine goes out on time and it's funny, I let the staff do whatever they want. And if that included spiking the office water cooler with booze every once in a while as a gag, so be it. Gaines' team was diverse by 1950s standards. There were a lot of Jewish New Yorkers, several of whom were first-generation Americans. Matt also picked up an exile from Castro's Cuba, 
a Spanish immigrant via Mexico, a refugee from a Madison Avenue ad agency, a portrait painter from the Ladies Home Journal, a photographer who blew, flew bomber missions during World War II, a Georgia boy who thought it'd be fun to hop in a car and give New York City a try, and many, many other oddballs and misfits. These strong personalities led to strong disagreements. Mad Staff was an equal opportunity in Soul Parade where everyone shared in the mockery. As mad writer Dick DiBartolo explained, no matter how good anything or anybody is, you dump on them and their work. Mutual admiration led to mutual trashing, and the battle scars resulted in a better mad. Advertisers fought with Gaines about mad satires of their ads. Gaines and the team doubled down on the gags and dropped all outside advertising creating Mad's unique independence, and this is decades before HBO and Netflix hopped on the no-ad bandwagon. Instead of boring staff meetings, Gaines would load up on Mad's Mad Men and take them on crazy group vacation. One Mad writer compared them to an unrehearsed Marx Brothers movie on, vacation, on location. Or he'd invite all the Mad Men over to his apartment to put on a musical review in which all the songs made fun of the boss. No idea was deemed too stupid or unbusinesslike to try. Editor Al Feldstein dubbed them all the usual gang of idiots, and the fractious family wore the humble, that insult as a badge of honor. And that humble brag insult is still on the magazine's masthead. In fact, it's in the current rebooted number one issue that you can find at your friendly neighborhood comic shop. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the only route to innovation is to collect a bunch of weirdos, encourage them to prank each other, mock the boss and all authority figures, and fight like a dysfunctional family. <laughs> but I will say that I've tried it myself, working in the wild days of cable television in the 1980s, and kick me signs, prank phone calls, making faces behind the boss when he talked, and many more matter stunts helped us to create a revolution in television. At least that's true for TNT, TBS, TCM, and all the other projects for which I'm proud to have been one of the usual gang of idiots. <laughs> and here's the thing. The Harvard eggheads weren't wrong. Diverse teams, healthy disagreements, and agile improvisation really are the keys to innovation. But the management gurus forgot the most important part of the puzzle, making sure to encourage the madness of the collective. The best leaders learn to cultivate their group's weirdness, collecting a variety pack of crazies, oddballs, and misfits to dream up futures that only weirdos can really imagine. You can channel Bill Gaines, create a sandbox for your mad team to play in, and stand back and watch the results. Or, better yet, you can find your own inner weirdo and proudly go a little mad yourself. After all, what's the worst that can happen? You've got nothing to worry about. Thanks. <laughs>